Uh, Viviana, are you going to do the uh, Facebook? Yes, I I did. You did. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Elena Rios, uh, and this is for the National Hispanic Health Foundation. Uh, we are having our clinical research webinar, How to Engage Pediatric Hispanic Patients and Families in Clinical Trials. And we have two outstanding guests that I will introduce in a minute. But first, we have some housekeeping. All participant microphones will be muted. Um, Please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box uh, for the panelists to address during our Q&A session at the end of the hour. Please fill out the short post-webinar survey that will be emailed out after the event and also shown as a QR code at the end of the slides. Recording will be housed on the NHHF website, which is nhmafoundation.org and also sent out one week after the event. Um, we uh, encourage you to use the Q&A box so that we can use the chat box uh, with our staff in case there's any internal issues, you know, technology. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. We also offer CME credits uh, for doctors and other health professionals uh, from the um, <clears throat> AMEDCO company to the National Hispanic Health Foundation. And it's one hour of uh, AMA credit. Next slide. So the objectives today are to understand the importance of diversity and inclusion in pediatric clinical trials, especially specifically focusing on engaging Hispanic patients and families. Number two is to understand barriers and challenges faced by Hispanic patients and families in accessing and participating in pediatric clinical trials, including cultural, linguistic, socioeconomic, and structural factors, lack of understanding of clinical research and processes, understanding the historical and cultural factors that contribute to mistrust of Hispanic families to clinical research. And number three, to understand strategies and best practices. Uh, communication strategies addressing misconceptions about clinical trials and building trust. Next slide. So the National Hispanic Health Foundation, our mission is to improve the health of Hispanics in the United States uh, by promoting education and research uh, and advocating for policies that address the unique health needs of the Hispanic population. And we do seek to reduce health disparities and ensure equitable access to health care. And that is our website, nhmafoundation.org. And let me just mention that this uh, session is the last session uh, with our sponsor named Amgen that we've been very happy to work with. We've done a great uh, service, I think, to finding doctors and others interested in clinical trials that we have recruited for the Amgen uh, training sessions that they're involved with. And we're also very happy to announce that we're ha we have another sponsor. Uh, next slide, I think might we might have the new sponsor on the next slide. No, not yet. The National Center for Hispanic Health Research is our um, place at the foundation that is where our webinars are housed. The mission is to understand and address the unique health needs of Hispanics with an unwavering commitment to fostering health equity through education and awareness. One of the main objectives is to elevate the prominence of Hispanic physicians and other researchers in clinical research within the community. With a steadfast focus on advancing research education and advocacy, the NCHHR is poised to lead transformative initiatives that promote the health and well being of Hispanics across the nation. Next slide. And uh, again, these are just part of what we're already doing. We've been in we've been in operation for three years. We have a registry now of about 3000 Hispanic physicians who are PIs in clinical trials across the country. We have an education program where we are developing webinars and also toolkits and other resources that will be on our website this year. 
And we have a mentorship program that we are planning for next year, for 2025, to start developing the connection between medical students, especially, and maybe even pre-med students who would like to have an experience working with a mentor who's a researcher already to better uh, increase motivation to think about a research career in your medical practice or in a clinic or even in academics. Next slide. Oh. So the About Equitable Breakthroughs in Medicine Development, EQBMED, is our new sponsor. And we're very happy to work with Yale School of Medicine, who is the lead on the, uh, on the coalition, Morehouse School of Medicine also, Vanderbilt Health, and the RCMI Coordinating Center, which is at Morehouse. This Equitable Breakthroughs in Medicine development is a pilot project uh, supported by pharma. Uh, and it, it's very important to realize that we need to do pilot projects to better understand how to, how to have medical practices uh, and included that are in communities of color in underserved areas. And the focus of this air, uh, pilot project is going to be in the Southeastern United States. So we're very happy to be a part of it and to help increase awareness. If any of you out there are in the Southeast, please let us know. We'd love to include you in our uh, reports to uh, the EQBMED. Next slide. The ecosystem includes sites and communities, the clinical trial sites, they've just announced four. They're hoping to get up to 10 within the next year. The partners are community-based, faith-based, and professional partners. And we are included in the professional partners as National Hispanic Health Foundation. And I might add the National Hispanic Medical Association is also a partner. We work closely with them. And our, our sponsors really are to collaborate uh, with sites to shape clinical protocols, to have a more inclusive clinical research uh, program and to host trials aligned with community priorities. So it's a very uh, comprehensive approach to developing uh, DEI within clinical trial world. Uh, next slide. So our first speaker is Dr. Claudia Espinoza. She is an associate professor of pediatrics and uh, in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Disease at the University of South Florida. Uh, Claudia, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Rios. Uh, first of all, I really wanna thank the organization for um, inviting me to participate today. Um, I think that I really believe that the way to, that we are gonna advance research in populations that are of different background is really doing training others to do this right. Next. Okay, I do have some conflict of interest that I have to disclose, obviously, because I have been doing a lot of these clinical um, trials research. Then I, um, I have worked with many organizations, many sponsors, and I have all of them are there. Next. And today I really wanna, I make sure that the uh, audience understand the importance of diversity and inclusion in pediatric clinical trials and discuss some of the barriers and ch challenges that are faced by the Hispanic patients and their families in accessing and participating in pediatric clinical trials. Also, I, I would like to explore some strategies and communication best practice to address misconceptions and, and build trust in clinical research. Next. So what does this mean, closing the diversity gap? Which is the diversity gap in research? And I wanna start with this because um, maybe many of you are very aware of this, but maybe some are not. Uh, the Hispanic uh, population comprise about 20% of the uh, United States population. But when we look into organizations that are uh, looking at or doing clinical research, for example, the National Cancer Institute, we realize that only 10% of the, participating, the, the participants in clinical trials uh, in cancer research are really Hispanic or Latinos. 
If we go to another organization, for example, the FDA, we notice that only 4% of the participants are reported that are Hispanic or Latinos. So as we all can imagine, it will be really hard for researchers to develop unique culturally and environmentally appropriate novel treatments for the Hispanic population. As many of you know, there are some diseases that are um, either uh, presented or just uh, they manifest the differently depending on the background and the racial and ethnicity of the patient. Um, some other diseases that occur more in Hispanics and other ones uh, that never occur and we see it in other populations. So it's very important to develop specific trials for them. Also, decreasing the gap of diversity will promote healthcare equity and reduce those disparities in healthcare outcomes, which is at the end what we really want. Next. So let's go with uh, some effective interventions that have been reported by some um, medical uh, studies or, or clinical studies. And recruitment, um, I think it's key to always use bicultural or bilingual research assistance. That will facilitate uh, um, the process of recruitment for the Hispanic population. Also building in prior relationships, let's say, uh, you have already de developed a, a um, established relationship with a church or maybe community events or uh, maybe a group of people in a community. And then um, you, you want to build from that. You want to show up for the community when they need you and then you can approach them with um, research and, and that would increase your participation. Community partners and champions, it's really important to identify those individuals in the community and then use them to um, approach other patients. I cannot underemphasize like the, the bilingual communication, telephone reminders, emails, flyer, posters, information and material, everything needs to be in both languages. And if you are sure of a certain population or if the patient tells you that they only speak Spanish, then that's the language that all the communication should be on. And most recently, we have been using some digital marketing like um, Facebook, geotargeting, Google, and those have been um, novel and also important in recruiting our patients. Now, when we go into the now you recruit your patients, but how do we do to re retain them in the clinical trial? How do you ensure that these patients are gonna be compliant and adhere to the treatments or to the uh, clinical trials? So some interventions that have been effective are bilingual education and, and videos, interactive videos are work better than just a, a video that uh, doesn't ask any questions to the, to the patients. Um, Another thing that I cannot emphasize enough will be the importance of using materials that have low literacy. Um, for uh, non-Hispanic patients, we also have to uh, make sure that everything that we deliver in terms of um, informational material is gonna be for low literacy. So the same needs to be done for Hispanic. Care coordination by patient navigation, they always help uh, because actually the patients form a really strengthened relationship with the, with the care coordinators and with the patient navigators. Uh, they uh, reach them first than the PI or the research coordinator. Developing agreements is something that has been uh, named as uh, important for ret retain and uh, hear patients to clinical trials, but I feel that um, it depends on the trial. Uh, for some patients, uh, agreements and signing agreements may be uh, really uh, scary, scary for them. So um, if there is no need for them, then, then maybe for some specific trials you may use, maybe not for other ones. Increasing site visits and follow-up interviews is another important, um, important topic because for some 
clinical research, some studies, the design is to follow up at two years. If we only do one follow up every year, there is going to be a much higher rate of um, losing patients during that time. So increasing the, the visits and the interviews um, are going to be more uh, really important. Also for the researchers, if they have um, more tightened and closing um, site visits, that will help for the researcher to keep up with the uh, recruitment and the retention and adherence. Validate and update contact information for the patients. Um, Hispanic population uh, has been noticed to have a really high rate of mobility, and especially when there are uh, specific populations like immigrant uh, or, or migrants that are um, 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 specifically the ones that are um, going into the crops and, 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 and in the agriculture business. Validate and update. The contact information is gonna keep your patients enrolled. And uh, weekly reminding phone calls that will help you know what is going on with your patients. Um, some uh, studies have report weekly homework assignments and content discuss, um, which for some patients may be motivational, but so for some other ones may be uh, not that motivational. So um, it will be important to maybe um, uh, just determine how important it is for the term uh, population next. Now here there are some reported barriers and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because I know that we have another speaker that probably is gonna touch on some of these, but um, they have been categorized usually in three different aspects. The society barriers, which are gonna be um, included the income and the cost, the lack of Transportation is huge for the Hispanic population. The lack of child or elder care. If we don't have that, if we don't put it in our um, in in our visits, then that may um, affect the possibility for these patients to come back for the uh, for, for the vi subsequent visits. Inconvenience: where is located the uh, the site of the visit and time demands associated with participation usually are a barrier. But uh, there are other barriers that are related more to the participants' belief. Uh, for example, fear of adverse events of the medication that we are using if it is a clinical trial of intervention. Perception of the participants that they are being treated as guinea pigs, that's something that also happens in this population and in other ones too. Um, the belief that there is a health-related fear. I don't want to participate because maybe I am going to be diagnosed with a disease that I didn't have it to start with. Um, the beliefs in the religions. So some religions are really not um, um, bringing uh, clinical trials uh, or, or they don't understand really what the study is. And I have been in that position in that I have to talk to the pastor in order for my patient to be recruited. So that has to be uh, having in consideration. Some other um, uh, barrier related participation beliefs, including the privacy concern, especially when there is uh, uh, problems with um, uh, topics that are gonna be uh, private and, and, and there may be concerns with that. For example, in adolescents, in which we are trying to investigate about sexually transmitted disease, that can be a problem. And the lack of, uh, in general, interest in clinical trials. Finally, there are some participated related barriers. For example, age children and adolescents are, may not be able to participate uh, by themselves, right? They need to buy in the parents to be bring them and, and agree with the trial for them to be in the trial. And some uh, legal immigration status uh, that always come up with this population. Next. Now, how we can overcome some of those um, barriers? So for example, for the uh, distrust the fear of clinical trials, um, then uh, not only uh, that involves the staff and the providers, but also unsafe treatments or even the 
the fear of adverse events of being in the um, in the intervention group and then maybe having adverse events or uh, fear of immigration status or being discriminated just because uh, of their race and ethnicity. So some solutions that uh, some have uh, used is establishing that trust with the research staff, using the community partners that as I mentioned before and incorporated cultural values into every material that we are gonna discuss with them. Uh, finally, familyism, which is a term that is really interesting and it is just bringing the family to, um, so you are um, enrolling a pediatric patient, but you really are enrolling the whole family. Uh, regarding the lack of clinical trial awareness, education is key and all education, as I mentioned before, should be in the primary language, culturally appropriate and um, at the level of the health uh, research literacy. And finally, uh, regarding the lack of clinical trial access, it's very important that we train other physicians as primary investigators, bilingual physicians as primary investigators. And also, it's very important that primary physicians believe in the process. Otherwise, your patients may start but may not continue. Next. Other barriers that we can address with different uh, uh, interventions are, for example, with the Affordable Care Act, the Hispanic health care was improved. But um, as many of us know, we that work with patients know that gaps remain. Um, and coverage gaps are really uh, important in these states that have not expanded Medicaid. Um, just now, right after COVID, many people fell off with Medicaid, and those are going to be the ones that are going to have access. If they don't have access to go to the regular doctor, the pediatrician, then they are not going to be um, eligible or they are not going to have access to get into these clinical trials. Um, and then uh, for healthcare providers, it will be really important to improve the language and cultur cultural barriers uh, with the Hispanic patients through training opportunities, just like this seminar does, just like this uh, um, wonderful organization is doing, supporting diversity and healthcare staff, and also addressing implicit bias between us and not only providers, but also our staff. And sponsors must also do their part to improve diverse trial participation. There are maybe some other things that they can do to include uh, patients. And, and you know, I, I am one of those that uh, those investigators that if the materials are not in Spanish, I don't sign for the trial because I really think that it's important that I offer them uh, my Hispanic patients the same offers that I do to the other uh, populations. Next. And then finally, the conclusion, uh, it's very important that we prioritize diversity in clinical trials, and that should be our goal to provide the most effective treatments for uh, Hispanic population. And by the way, we all need to be aware that by the um, year 2050, which is not that uh, far, um, then we, our Hispanic population is really gonna make up one quarter of the US population. So we need to improve now so we can provide better care to these patients in the future. Um, and then lastly, uh, oh, so the, appears to be, to be no universal strategy to improve recruitment and participation of Hispanic into research, but a combination of key elements from several strategies will be the mm -hmm. best to include more patients in research. And with that, I conclude my uh, my part of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Espinoza. Uh, very, very um, comprehensive. Um, and uh, I can see that you're very in tune with your patients and get them all into clinical trials. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Bernardo Ng, who's a medical director and co-founder of the Sun Valley Research Center incorporated in the San Diego area. Uh, Dr. Ng, do you have slides? There they are. You're on mute, uh, Dr. Ng. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rios. Um, well, it's going to be a hard act to follow after Dr. Espinosa's presentation, but I'll do my best. 
Uh, there are some things that are in common between my presentation and hers because we're working with the same population. I'm gonna to try to highlight our experience here on the other side of the country. I'm in California and um, I wanna thank you for this invitation and, and really excited about this uh, initiative. Hopefully uh, people who are connected can um, be excited and encouraged about uh, working with the Hispanic uh, participants. Okay, location. We are in California, in Imperial Valley. That's the furthest southeast county in California in the southeast corner right here. We have Mexico to the south. We have Arizona to the east. We have San Diego to the west. And we have the Southern Sea in the north. Um, the population is about 180,000 people. We have 82% Hispanic presence, which is double that of Cal the average in California, which is about 44, 45. The main labor is agriculture, or at least the, how it originated. The high school dropout rate is 25%, which is one of the highest in the state as well. And of course, there's a lot of speaking Spanish people. I have a photo here of the Imperial County Public Health Department and one of the prisons in the state, which amount for the other two, two out of the three highest employers besides agriculture. Uh, this is to show you the test scores in Imperial County are re really low, only uh, here you have the images. Um, this is mathematics. The darker blue is for elementary school. The lighter blue is for middle school. It's only 3% and it's 8% at both levels for reading. So this already tells you uh, or highlights something that Dr. Espinosa also mentioned about the importance of communicating uh, what uh, clinical trials are about, the risks, the uh, safety measures at a level that will be understood by our Hispanic patients. Um, this is another one of the employers, the irrigation district takes care of the power and the water in the county. Uh, so we have uh, manufacturing agriculture but there's a lot of poverty, migration. And uh, in fact, in 2009, El Centro, which is the largest city in the county, was the poorest city in the country. Uh, so our challenges, and, and uh, I want to stick to these three, which uh, I think are the ones that, that sound uh, or make more noise in our environment. They're not the only ones, but these are the three we've been working on. Lack of awareness. Uh, most of our patients don't know what clinical trials are. And as Dr. Espinosa mentioned, there's this risk of misperception. As it is, uh, they're scared to go to the doctors. The idea of participating in a clinical trial is even scarier. And the last thing, logistics, which already, already they were already mentioned by Dr. Espinosa, our um, in, uh, ecosystem here is such that we have... A, a, a spread out county, the cities can be 30 to 35 miles apart and there is no public transportation. So we have to be sure that we provide that for those who are interested in participating. And uh, transportation is one thing, making it on time to their visits, especially with the pediatric population because we need to accommodate to their schedules. They, they need to be in the afternoon, the visits, uh, so they can make the appointments. And this is how we present in our website. Uh, why should I participate uh, in a clinical trial? So we tell them that it's convenient. They can get full evaluations. There's no cost. If they're not insured, uh, we're still going to see them. And even if they don't uh, end up qualifying for a clinical trial, they already got an evaluation uh, by specialized uh, staff and, and got lab work done and even EKGs and things like that. We want to make it clear that they get compensated. And this is very important because at first glance, it could be taken as, oh, you know, how can you uh, participate fairly if you're getting paid for participate? No, I think this is a, a, an ethical debate that has already been clarified. People who participate in clinical trials have their own occupations, they are donating their time, and this is only a fair compensation. Any of the activities, uh, none of the activities will be um, 
uh, at, at any cost. And probably the most important, and from our end, our experience has been something that is probably underestimated in the past, is the chance to contribute to science, to the advancement of, of healthcare. And, and you know, uh, not only with adults, but also with children, uh, I think among Hispanics, there is this altruistic streak. It's probably part of our culture, or I, I don't know where it comes from, but when you know that uh, even if uh, you don't, you turn out not to have the right diagnosis, or even with the possibility that you're going to be on the placebo arm, and even the possibility that you may have side effects, the fact that you can contribute to science for other Hispanic people in the country has turned out to be very valuable. So we make sure we tell them that. And um, also that the goal, we make it very clear because uh, early on we said, you know, there's a chance you can get treated and, you know, something that you have not been able to be, you haven't been able to address from your previous doctors uh, that, uh, or previous visits or clinics, maybe we can figure it out here. We were very open and very uh, clear saying, you know, that the main goal of clinical trials is to collect data, as well as we make it very clear that going through the clinical trial has much, uh, many, many more safety measures than uh, getting uh, typical clinical care. And that's even without adding the fact that many of the FDA uh, approved medications are approved on clinical trials that happen in uh, samples with very, very few Hispanics or Latinos. So we, we try to show both sides, uh, the advantages and disadvantages, as well as the potential benefits and risk. Okay. And of course, I, I think I'm just gonna leave that image over there. Dr. Espinosa already mentioned about the importance of having a bilingual uh, team uh, of people working so that uh, whenever the patient feels uh, that it's more convenient to speak in Spanish, we can offer that. Okay, and now I'm gonna show you pretty much so, so you get an idea of how many patients we have to contact or pre-screen so that we can succeed on recruitment. I wanna share some numbers of actual studies that we've carried in the last 12 months. So we participated in one um, for... Um, um, autistic uh, <clears throat> spectrum disorder, uh, irritability, carepresin is a medication that's already approved uh, for other indications. We had to pre-screen over 550, uh, well, potential participants. Of course, it was their parents that we talked to so that we could screen nine of those five were screen failures. The other four were randomized, but of all of those eight, were of Hispanic or Latino background. Then we have an ADHD study on children and adolescents with guanfacine. That's a very old medication, very safe, has shown to be very noble. Well, with that, it took us over a thousand pre-screen calls to get six patients to be screened for the study, two failed, four were randomized, and all of the six were Hispanic. We have a migraine study with lasmiditan. This is a medication that has not been approved yet. And we had to pre-screen over a hundred people, uh, potential participants, only to get three screens. And of those, no one, no one was of Hispanic background. And that's very interesting because it's not that migraine does not happen uh, in, uh, in Hispanic children, but uh, probably the reason was fear uh, of participating. And then we have another with children, same experience has been very hard. That's a newer medication, trocandy extended release. And we have another study of ADHD for children with centenafidine, almost 500 uh, calls to be able to screen nine people. And of those nine were of Hispanic background, only three were randomized and only three uh, uh, completed. And finally, an ADHD study with adolescents and the same molecule, 692 uh, calls so we could get four screens, uh, screening visits of which three failed, but the four of them were Hispanic. So um, I wanna highlight the fact that uh, it takes a lot of uh, patients contacted, potential participants contacted before we can get uh, uh, an actual 
a screening visit and an actual randomized patient. Uh, Dr. Espinosa already talked about social media. We do a lot of community outreach and then we post it on our social media. So if you see to your far right, that's part of our staff participating in health fairs. And then number one and number two, I give you examples of uh, posts that we do in Spanish and also posts that we do in English. Uh, all these have to be IRB approved. Well, not the post about the health uh, uh, fairs, but the ones about uh, specific studies. Okay, so in my conclusions, uh, recruiting Hispanic and Latino children and adolescents is both challenging and necessary. Uh, increased awareness is key to clinical trials acceptance. Parents need to be comfortable with safety issues. That's obviously very important. Contributing to science is more valuable than you would think. And for any pre-screening, from pre-screening to completion, it takes a team and this is our team. And uh, I wanna highlight the fact that we all have Hispanic background, all everybody speaks Spanish and English. And um, uh, we, really, we really like what we do. Thank you. What am I asking? Wait a minute. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ng. Uh, so, you know, I want to invite everyone on the call to send in your questions to the Q&A box. I did see a few mentions of, of uh, I'll just say, of curiosity and also interest in the whole issue of pediatrics and clinical trials. But there was one issue that came up a couple of times, and that was mental health. And Dr. Ng, uh, because you you are the uh, specialist here on mental health, could you tell us when you have a pediatric patient that's interested in clinical trials, but you know that they have a mental health background, uh, what is it that, is there some uh, triaging that you do to allow them to come into clinical trials? Um, do you have to talk to the parents? How do you deal with, and, and let, let's say adolescents that could act out and you know, maybe not be compliant with clinical trials? How, how do you help the process or how do you have your staff help the process to make sure that the families understand the importance of coming back to collect data to, to you know, to have a patient that might have some um, accommodations that you have to do because they have some mental uh, illness that is maybe medically treated, but they, again, it could be a, a, a kind of a dicey situation. Yes, so uh, I'm a psychiatrist, uh, 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 first of all. So uh, my, my staff is, is very used to working with uh, such population. Uh, Sun Valley Research Center was founded in 2008 and is the sister to Sun Valley Behavioral Medical Center that has been, that was founded in 1998. So actually the outpatient clinic is the source of a lot of the participants and what we do there when we find that a patient could benefit from participating in a trial or we have the right trial for the patient that I have in front of me, we already have a process where I just let my staff know, you know what, I already talked to uh, Juan and his parents and uh, they would like to learn more about whatever trial. And we already have a process where they move to a separate side of the building where they get explained right away at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when we, uh, when we talk about the community, part of the strategy that I had even mentioned is that we visit doctors, in this case, pediatricians, and we go back and go back at least quarterly to update them on what uh, studies we have. And um, it, it's, it's very interesting. Some of them are really open to it. Some of them even allow us to have our staff visit. We write memorandums of understanding so that they they let us look at their uh, uh, records uh, or we have staff there really fast. If they have, you know, I have a question on this patient who might be interested. So we try to respond really fast. And, but then the challenge is for them to remain interested. So uh, our, for us, the key is that the first thing is the parents need to be safe about the whole process. So once they do that, then we go with the child or the adolescent where they won't necessarily want to participate, right? Uh, and uh, so we, we try to um, uh, 
keep uh, an environment which is, uh, a, uh, you know, not boring. You know, we keep them busy. We give them crayol crayons and, and where they can draw and write. With, with adolescents, it's sometimes tougher. <laughs> uh, so we, we had one in the past with migraine, we did okay. But for example, ADHD, we try to go uh, keep a, a very fluent visits because they get bored really quickly and want to leave. And some of the visits get very long. You know, I do my assessments and then um, they, they have to get their blood drawn, they get to get an EKG, they get, uh, get weight and measured. So it, they become long visits. So we try to keep them uh, busy, occupied and comfortable. Uh, but uh, they are definitely a greater challenge than recruiting adults. Yes. Dr. Espinoza, there's a question about virtual interventions and you know with the COVID-19 pandemic we've now become a, a lot more uh, uh, used to using telemedicine telehealth can you tell us how you have been able to use uh, virtual uh, or telemedicine with your clinical trial uh, protocols yes and you know, as a matter of fact, a lot of sponsors for clinical trials for medications, for example, for antibiotics or antimicrobials, they uh, prefer to use some type of platform where the patients can put like the adverse events and things like that, right? And we also can do a lot of follow-up that way. And, and I'm going to tell you that I believe that um, these interventions are now for everybody. Uh, there are some patients that would love them, especially the youngest ones, right? The mom that has five kids and maybe don't have time to go there, but she can jump in the phone and get a telehealth visit. But um, there are some other ones that they don't like it. So we need to be mindful of that. Those interventions may not work for everybody. Um, but you're right. Since COVID, we all are being more aware that they exist. We are more comfortable speaking in, in the phone uh, than we used to do before. And I think that as long as your patients have a good relationship with you and they trust on the system, they may be willing to do some of those visits or some of those interventions or interactions that you need uh, through that way. Uh, but I think it's not for everybody. Okay. So we just, you know, we just go with the flow. So with the ones that like it. So let me, I, I, I was just told my questions uh, or my comments aren't going to everyone. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Let me remind everybody, everybody that we would like your questions for the panelists to go to the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. And we do have uh, a few more questions. I, uh, one question uh, to Dr. Ng is, are, are you working with the medical school? I know uh, UC San Diego and yes. San Diego State University so, are very interested in clinical trials and didn't know how, how you, uh, as a as a private doctor, you know, in the community, uh, how you connect to the medical school. Yes, uh, we're very open. We're a small organization, so it's easy to get paperwork through the, our system. Um, right now, we're with the USC um, dementia project and uh, on the clinical side uh, we have rotations for the nurse practitioner mental health and psychiatric program from the UC system which began at UCF but now it includes all the UC all the UCs in the state mm -hmm. and uh, yeah we're open uh, we've also been a site where we get IMGs to rotate so those who are interested in going into psychiatry residency We've done very well in the last two years. We had uh, six uh, physicians visiting and they all uh, all matched uh, either in psychiatry, one of them in pediatrics, another one in internal medicine. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're pretty open and we welcome people to come in. If there's a university interested other than uh, the ones we're working with, we, we mm -hmm. can talk, you can rotate here if you want. Uh, and just to let you know, uh... Uh, a, a young doctor, a pediatric resident is actually looking to work in a private office after graduation and try to learn how to set up a research project. I think that's the kind of young people that we're looking for to be in our mentoring program. And I know someone else mentioned, uh, why don't we 
work with the PhD students. Great idea. Uh, Dr. Espinoza, Dr. Ng, either of you, do you, can you tell us how we might reach more uh, PhD and residents? It's, it's just so hard because we were just out in social media in general and our databases are usually doctors that are already out of school, but we need we need to reach the next generation. Any any ideas? Well, okay, so I want to be very clear that I'm not affiliated uh, with any school per se, like to come and do a, a postdoc. We don't qualify uh -huh. for that. But if you want to come on your own time and see what you're we're doing, you're welcome. On the pediatric pediatric resident, I don't know if you're licensed in California, but if you want to have a practice right away, come to Imperial County. My God, you're gonna have people knocking at your door right away. And if besides that you want to do clinical trials, we are uh, in a moment of expansion where we're going out of the uh, central nervous system uh, uh, field. Uh, and both for children, adults, and older adults. So uh, that part, we we should talk. Dr. Rios, I, I do want to put the, maybe put the seed here about the um, section of international medical graduates through the American Academy of Pediatrics. I used to be a member, an executive member there, and they do a lot of a lot of work with the um, um, international medical graduates. So that may be another way, another platform that the organization gets more, um, you know, more more people interested. Um, I yes. know that the, a lot of you know just young graduates, right, that just came to or just come to the United States trying to get their testing done and everything, like get the US Melly, uh, what say, they um, may reach to this uh, section for information. And I think that uh, partner, partnering with them will be beneficial for both groups. And I can, um, you know, I can send you uh, the, the person to contact um, so you, you have that information, but it is through the American right. Academy of Pediatrics. Okay, no, great, thank you. And uh, our sister organization, the National Hispanic Medical Association is developing a council of IMGs. We have a council of, of uh, residents and fellows and a council of young physicians. Uh, and we have had IMG doctors uh, at our conferences and chapter meetings. And yes, there's a lot of, uh, interaction between our members and IMGs. We just need to, and maybe on the NHHF side, figure out how to help them with the research. And I do know that uh, they can get visas uh, and be supported by not, we're a 501c3 organization. Mm -hmm. So if anybody, anybody out there has an IMG interested, an international medical doctor interested in research, we'd be happy to connect and learn how we could be of service and be a resource which is what we're trying to do. We don't want to do the training. We want to be a resource for those who are doing the yeah. trainings of clinical uh, research in our communities. So a few few more questions. And, and if you both want to answer, it's what's been your experience with e-diary compliance among Hispanic parents? And what advice could you provide? And if you could explain what that is, I'm, I'm not a pediatric or a practicing doctor. Go ahead, Dr. Espinosa. Yeah, the e-diaries are, um, and, and usually how I work with them uh, or how I tell, you know, parents is that um, they are platforms like web platforms where the patients can get connected through different devices. Most days, most of, of them nowadays use their own phone and they get connected to the web platform from the sponsor company. And then mm -hmm. in there, they can put like all, all what happened in the day, if there is a new symptom when they are taking any medication, uh, then they can put it in there. Um, and you know, I am gonna tell you, um, I feel that the best way for people to get uh, those diary, e diaries feel is really if you put a some small token of appreciation connected to it. If you, because, you know, most of the, the trials, they make you 
um, they only give you um, compensation for your time, right? And so yeah. if you come to the place, then they you will get a you know so like a gift card or whatever it is that they are give offering to the research participant. Uh, but for the e-diaries, many don't. And so we have also put that in our budget that we really wanna make sure that these uh, parents actually get yeah. some type of compensation because that's time that they have it's to use. It's a lot of time, yes. Yeah, and so that's how I get it uh, like more compliant, my patients, if I, if I do that. Well, that's great. Uh, I think uh, here's another one, another question. Uh, Dr. Ng, uh, a medical Spanish interpreter works for a medical center and wants to know, uh, and it may be Dr. Espinosa too, about using uh, Spanish translate translators uh, and do you, uh, or translation material, do you do outreach and reminder for um, appointments in Spanish as well? Totally, totally. Um, I want to add that our experience with e-diary is very, very similar with what Dr. Spinoza just described. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really hard, I just want to say. Uh, and, and sometimes the whole trial can fail, uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the subject's participation can fail just because of that, right? Uh, oh. So very important. And we do something very similar to what she was saying. As to the Spanish translation, you know that uh, is very interesting because in our area, or rather on, at our site, it's not such a, a big issue because we're all bilingual. But I have colleagues here who, you know, we have uh, some doctors who are not Hispanic. And oh my God, they, but usually the support staff, uh, you know, if they're local people, most people here are bilingual, but I can yeah. imagine that in other sites, bigger ones uh, 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 where the staff may not be bilingual, uh, definitely uh, translators or interpreters are needed. And very similar to what Dr. Espinosa said in her presentation, um, we're not as, as radical as not signing a contract if the materials are not available in Spanish, but we do say that we cannot uh, promise, you know, the the recruitment they expect, and sometimes they still, uh, you know, want to do the trial with us uh, because uh, it varies considerably our potential results if we cannot recruit in Spanish with Spanish materials. Right, I think that's so important to, uh, especially to the patients. Uh, but but another question similar to this is. For, for those doctors who are not Spanish speakers, uh, what would you suggest uh, besides bilingual staff? Is there, have you used any of the, uh, you know, uh, translation lines or anything like that, that that you think makes sense for clinical trials? Well, we haven't. Um, and, but let me tell you, we, I was in, um, I used to work at a at a uh, detention center for hmm. people who were getting deported, and it's so impressive. I mean, the ecosystem is dominated by people who either spoke English or spoke Spanish. But whenever, for someone who's bilingual, whenever you face someone who doesn't speak either language, oh my God, it's really paralyzing. So I I, I got the experience of our colleagues who are not Spanish speaking. And, and at that moment, anything that can help helps. Like, uh, you know, we've used the at t translation service and um, I don't have much experience with AI or automated uh, translation services. I'm sure they're gonna be not as efficient as a human, but uh, I think that uh, it's inevitable that they're gonna come into this environment as well, if they not already doing it in, in other yeah. settings. And Dr. Espinoza in Florida, what is your experience with so many Spanish speakers and not enough Spanish speaking doctors, or I shouldn't say just doctors, but staff involved in clinical trials? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I have been blessed that in every place where I am doing my clinical trials, I have um, some of the, re at least one person that speaks Spanish, because that's so important. I just cannot imagine, right, like uh, trying to do this and enrolling patients in uh, that are Hispanic without having the proper um, 
proper staff. So, you know, it facilitates for me because obviously I speak also Spanish. So they, they do feel that they are less threatened when you don't use your translation or another person. Uh, they trust you more than uh, if you use a translator. And so even if, even if it is only one person in the group, but it is very important to make sure that you have it. Uh, yeah. Because then they have that connection. Uh, when nobody in the team speak English, I mean, Spanish, I think that is very hard. I had that experience in, when I used to work in Kentucky. I was the only one that spoke Spanish. And so all my research coordinators were uh, spoken English. But then I did the like surveys that we needed to do. I did it myself because first it was easier. And second, the patients trust me. And, um, and then... You know, it was it was a lot simpler than trying to get one of these uh, other ways of communication. Do you uh, do you think that the sponsors, the pharma companies, for example, who provide funding for clinical trials, would they uh, develop uh, support for uh, bilingual staff, for example, or AT and T lines? in clinical trial sites where there aren't any bilingual staff, you know, to be able to pay for them. You know, that is, service. that is a very good question. I am not sure because obviously I am on the other side, right? On <laughs> the good side. Uh, but I, I will think that uh, they may not just, you know, they, those may be the sites where they are just going to not include a variety or not include patients from, Hispanic background and they just know it and they will not do it, I I think. Because I I don't think it is, um, a, a lot of them are gonna be willing to go in through extra cost uh, when there is nobody that is gonna support that in the in the team, right? Um, well, I, I, I would say thank you, Dr. Rios, for the idea. And knowledge. I think we should push for this all together. <laughs> Uh, because yeah, you're always in, your thinking is always ahead of us. Um, but yeah, I think I think we should be able to somehow, uh, because I agree with Dr. Espinosa, they probably don't care, but we should push it to make it a point that uh, those sites like ours should be paid better, number one. <laughs> and number two, yeah. that the areas, <laughs> <laughs> the areas were uh, like you were describing in Kentucky where there are uh, Hispanic people residing there, mm -hmm. Uh, that if they want to expand their ability to recruit uh, a, a more diverse population, that that should be on the contract as an option. And there may be sites that are not interested, they're doing great and they don't need any more. But for those who are trying to transition into being uh, able to recruit a more diverse population, that they should have that uh, the option of a greater benefit that way. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can't agree more. And just a last question, you know, one of the things that we have to do as an organization is develop information uh, in a toolkit. And just to ask if you had something that you think needs to be in a toolkit for, again, for the young investigators interested in helping to recruit more Latino pediatric patients into their clinical trials, um, We'd like to know what are the, some of the best things that could be done. And I know, Dr. Espinosa, let me start with you. You had a lot of ideas, a lot of things, a lot of experience. Um, but what do you think is maybe uh, the top number one and two type of interventions? I'm sorry to um, to recruit to, to recruit, recruit the Latino students into your clinic, the Latino patients into your clinical trials that are pediatric. You mentioned a lot of important interventions that overcome barriers. Yes. Um, but if we had to describe some, uh, let's say, uh, promising solutions that would work for everybody, you know, the top one or two priority interventions, what would you say would be more important? Just a, to be right. fundamental in any clinical trial reaching pediatric yeah. Um, and you know, I think that my staff has to must speak Spanish also. To, I think that that's the most important one because then you will get and then this this alliance with with the 
community partners. If you can get okay. them and if you can get the primary physicians, the pediatricians, mm -hmm. then you'll, you'll have a successful recruitment. If you don't have that, it's hard. Yeah. And Dr. Ring, what do you think with the, yes, I would, from, the from the psychiatric and mental health side, what do you think works? Uh, I, I was just best? laughing because I would, I would put on the opening of the, of the toolkit, be patient and don't give up. <laughs> That's <laughs> going to be the first thing. And the next thing is uh, it takes a team. It's, it takes a team. And if the team is bilingual, even better, but it does take a team. It's, it's a lot of work behind, you know, prior to the screening, and the follow-up and then in keeping that relationship for afterwards. So it's a, a lot of roles to play. So those would be my two things. Okay. Uh, one last question that I see that we haven't answered yet, and that's about genomics, uh, genomic testing and genetic testing in clinical trials. I know that the All of Us Research Program is providing that to the researchers, uh, you know, and to the patients. Uh, but have you been involved with any of uh, genetic testing yet? Uh, and if so, what what can you say about what you're doing or learning about it? Well, I, I I have, and I didn't mention it because it was not a pediatric trial. It was an adult, very clever. I I, I hope there's going to be something in the future. As you know, we've been able to do uh, genetic testing already for the ability to metabolize psychiatric medications, but that has really not helped much other than knowing learning about the tolerability of the medications, not the efficacy. Mm. So this one included patients who are already under treatment. They took the sample and then they, they're crossing it with their state of their depression and uh, what medications they're taking. So the next step will be that the, the genetic information is not only going to tell you if they can tolerate the medication, but hopefully under what genes, what medication work better. So hopefully we can get efficacy with that. Uh, and it was a not very non-invasive because the treatment didn't change. It was just the blood and saliva uh, collection. And it was a very easy test. We got over 200 people that, that it was one visit. They came, uh, uh, give the sample, answer uh, some questionnaires and got paid and left. And they were very happy to be participating for the future understanding of, of uh, depression and antidepressants. So we really well, did that's, well. That's great. Uh, and, and I say one last question, but I, I see one more that I didn't ask. And that is about your outreach. You mentioned uh, health fairs uh, to to find community people that are outside of your clinics or outside of your academic centers. Uh, what other places are good to find people in terms of clinics? I mean, uh, community uh, uh, to, to, to do more marketing so that others hear about it, you know, places where there are lots of people. Besides health fairs, where, where else in communities have you had success? Churches. They Churches. Are, yes. yes. Oh. And I'm, I'm telling you, sometimes I have to talk to the pastor, to the religious leader for my patients to participate. Otherwise, and, you know, it takes me an extra hour, but uh, then they are fine if they are fine. Okay. And you, Dr. Ring, any... Uh, no, we, we, well, we've done like nursing homes and uh, community centers. Uh -huh. um, and that's to focus on our older adults uh, studies. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's very important to share your knowledge uh, because you're, you're, you're living the, uh, the dream to create diversity in clinical trials, both of you. And I really want to thank you for, for uh, all your ideas and your slides and, want to tell the audience that again we will have uh the slides and the uh recording of this uh, webinar available in a week on our website which is nhmafoundation.org and uh just some updates here we have a a new webinar tomorrow for another program that we run we have a a diversity in public health workforce for looking for ways to outreach to african americans Latinos and Native Americans to work in the public health system of the future at the local level, state level, or federal level. So we're having a very important discussion tomorrow by an expert, uh, dean of one of the local law schools here, but it's a Supreme Court decision on the use of race, conscious admissions, and the impact to public health schools uh, and the options for compliance. Uh, and, and 
So we'd like to invite everybody here to, to join us tomorrow at two o'clock. And there's an RSVP link there. Uh, uh, and Dr. Ring, I, I, I see that you have to leave. And uh, Dr. Espinoza, again, thank you very much. This is a very worthwhile uh, uh, webinar. We have a survey. I'd like everybody that's still on uh, to please answer the survey. Uh, and here's the QR code. And we will be emailing all of the registrants uh, and participants to get your uh, comments. And I want to thank our staff, Viviana and Guillermo, who uh, helped tremendously with this webinar. And we have another QR code here. We're, we're all into QR codes now for sponsorship opportunities, mentorship, and our programs, and just to donate to our foundation. Our National Hispanic Health Foundation has the largest scholarship in the country that we give to Latinos that are in medical school, dental, nursing, pharmacy, PA, and public health. And we, we really want to help our next generation. And this webinar series is really about getting more uh, young people to think about going into clinical research as a career. Uh, and this one was for pediatric patients, but we have different topics and I welcome you to join us at our next one. We have them quarterly. So the next one will be in, in August. Uh, and I uh, look forward to, to meeting you and thank, the, thank you all again for joining the National Hispanic Health Foundation and our National Center for Hispanic Health Research. And uh, there's another Elena Rios there that I see is uh, Mr. Guadalupe Pacheco. Did you want to tell us who the speaker is tomorrow? You're on mute. No, I, I think you already did, Elena, but it's uh, Dr. Matthew. And she, she's a renowned kind of a civil rights uh, advocate for uh, health equity. As a matter of fact, she's developed like maybe three health equity clinics during her career. Okay. And she's very uh, passionate about how to tie law and public health together. What you is know. the, uh, the people are asking how to get to, how to RSVP? Is there a- uh... Yeah, there's, there's a link right there, the previous kind of slide. Can you put that slide back, Viviana? The next, go ahead. There it is, right there. Okay, there's RSVP the RSVP link. If right there, let's see if I click on it, will it show? No, doesn't work for me. Uh, doesn't work. Doesn't work. Oh. No. Uh, they can. Uh, is it on our website? Yes. The nhmafoundation.org website. And is it programs? NHMA oh, Foundation. Yes, it should be on the programs. Programs. And it is our public health diversity yes. program. And a, a very important webinar tomorrow. Yeah. So. And, and it's free. And it's free. Yes. <laughs> but we'll test you afterwards. Yeah. But anyway, thank you all very much. And we look forward to continuing to work in clinical research and increasing the number of Latinos that are not only patients, but are the actual researchers. And you don't have to be a doctor. You can be a PhD, you can be a community health worker, you can be a nurse. We need a whole team in our clinical trial sites across the country. Thank you very much. See ya.